Multi-celled forms of life existed from 1.05 billion years ago and perhaps even earlier. The oldest multi-celled organism is Bingia morpha pubescens, and that's where we get that number of 1.05 billion years ago. Bingia morpha pubescens was an algae, not an animal. For the first animal in the fossil record, we'd have to wait some time. This video will lay out the quasi-alien biosphere we find in the earliest time of clear evidence of animals on Earth namely the Ediacaran biota of the Ediacaran period, which lasted from 635 to 539 million years ago. Kindly like the video, subscribe to the channel if Big History interests you, and consider supporting me on LiberaPay or PayPal if you deem my work valuable. Let's go. Evidence for animal activity goes back to 635 million years ago in the form of molecules that are produced by animals, sponges to be specific. But these trace fossils come to us sans any related body fossils, so there's little to say about the form of this early life beyond that they were sponges. But in the Ediacaran period, our story changes. From over 35 sites on six continents, over 100 species have been discovered and named from this Ediacaran period. The fossil record shows abundant, relatively large life forms from about 580 million years ago and most of these life forms had vanished from the fossil record by the start of the Cambrian at 539 million years ago. The species that come from this period are very strange and often too ambiguous in nature to determine whether they belong to the kingdom of fungi or animalia or even something stranger still. Nonetheless, some of these species are largely agreed upon to be animals and their forms and ways were somewhat unique in the history of life. To start, Let's get a sense of the biosphere during this period. The fossils we have show that some forms of life existed more than a kilometer underwater, demonstrating that these species were living without photosynthesis. As we move towards more shallow water, where the sun's rays more comfortably reached, more Ediacaran life could be found. There are a couple of broad generalizations that can be made in demonstrating the uniqueness of this ecosystem in contrast to all ecosystems since. All, or almost all, of the animals during this time were soft-bodied. No shells, skeletons, or any other hard parts. Few, if any, had a gut. Mouths were scarce or non-existent. Most are not neatly bilateral, as so much of life, including us, is today. Organs of any sort weren't much of a thing. Eyes didn't exist. And life was centered around the sediment-water interface. Some animals burrowed in the sediment, but their burrows are incredibly shallow, right at the sediment surface. Some animals extended a couple of feet upward from the sediment floor, and they fixed themselves to the ground with parts of their body that we call holdfasts. Others may have been moving along the floor, though without legs. And while it would have been uncommon, there is a possibility that a couple may have even swum. With this basic vision of the ecosystem, let's take a closer look at the details of this story, as well as some key players to get more intimate with this period of life and these early life forms. There were two stages to the Ediacaran. The first pulse of life forms can be seen in the fossils of the Avalon assemblage, such as those discovered by Shiva Balak Misra at Mistaken Point in Newfoundland, Canada. Dating to 565 million years ago, most of the creatures of this find are rangeomorphs. They're frond-like looking creatures with flowering that repeated the larger structure of the organism in smaller and smaller form a further three times. The environment these life forms lived in was more than a kilometer underwater, too deep for photosynthesis to explain how they got their energy. They also don't have any mouths or guts, so it's thought that they were most likely osmotrophs, feeding through absorbing nutrients from the water. These basic body plans wouldn't require many genetic commands to bring about. It's estimated that just seven to eight genetic commands would be sufficient for these rangeomorphs, which can be contrasted to our more than 25,000 commands. It's unclear that these creatures of the first phase are animals. They're eukaryotic, most would agree, and the debate rages on as to whether these are very large single-celled protists, or maybe they're protofungi, or perhaps they're protoanimals. Two examples of these rangeomorphs are Fractofusis misri, which measured up to a foot long and held itself to the ocean floor, Another rangeomorph, Charnia, reached significantly higher and moved to and fro in the water like kelp. Charnia was as thin as a fingernail, and some of them reached up to a height of six and a half feet. To get a better sense of what this creature may have actually looked like, it's thought that Charnia closely resembled the modern sea pen. Then comes the second stage of our Ediacaran biota, 
These creatures come to us collectively from two assemblages, the White Sea Assemblage of 550 million years ago and the Nama Assemblage of a couple of million years later. Unlike the slightly deeper waters of the Avalon Assemblage, the White Sea Assemblage was laid down in shallower, sunlit water. The Nama Assemblage also comes from shallower water and from a tropical environment. In this second wave of Ediacaran life, the rangeomorphs of the first wave are still around but now things looking much more like animals are hanging out as well. Tribe Rachidium and Arcarua show a three-part and five-part pattern respectively, and are argued by some to be ancestral forms of echinoderms, an animal phylum that includes the notable members of sea urchins, starfish, and sea cucumbers. More animal-looking still is Dickinsonia, who looks like a segmented flatworm. Dickinsonia ranged from a few centimeters to several feet in length. Dickinsonia is also almost bilateral, though not perfectly so. It's possible that the Kinsonia moved about as it's left impressions on microbial mats that some paleontologists read as Dickinsonia's lifeway being moving atop a mat and absorbing microbes and then repeating the process. While clearly not attached to the floor, any mobility Dickinsonia may have had needn't have come from its own volition and may well have come from the movement of the water. Moving now to a creature that is even more animal-like, we have Spurginia which incidentally is named after the discoverer of fossils in the Ediacaran Hills of Australia that give this geological period its name. That man, Reginald Sprigg, in turn passed his name to Spurginia, who beyond the segmented body has a clear front and back end, with an apparent head as well. It also seems to have ribbing near the center line there, leading some to suggest that Spurginia might be an ancestral arthropod, looking as it does like the trilobites to come. Then there's Kimberella, a slug-like creature that ranged from 0.7 of an inch to 6 inches long. This creature is bilaterally symmetrical, showing that the major animal group of bilaterians had come to be. Kimberella, like Dickinsonia, moved about and left scratch marks in the sediment. A radula-like structure on Kimberella, which is how mollusks feed, has led some to suggest that Kimberella is an ancestral mollusk. Regardless of Kimberella's classification, we're clearly beginning to see movement on the ocean floor, and arguably, the first animals. The last creature I want to call attention to from this period is more for the sake of the coming Cambrian explosion than the Ediacaran. That creature is Claudina. Here's Claudina's fossil. What the animal that created this looks like is unknown, but perhaps it lived inside those cones. Anyway, the reason I bring Claudina up is twofold. For one, it's relatively hard, in contrast to the other Ediacaran biota and two, a borehole has been found in a Claudina fossil. Biologically created hard parts and animals preying on other animals, which the boring may well be evidence of, are major components of life in the coming Cambrian explosion. And we're likely seeing the first hints of that here. By 539 million years ago, these and the rest of the Ediacaran biota, for the most part, are gone from the fossil record. And the Cambrian period begins. There are three main ideas explaining the disappearance of the Ediacarans. I'll lay them out in simple form before considering them more fully. 1. The Ediacarans went extinct in some form of extinction event towards the end of the Ediacaran. 2. The Ediacarans remained around, but they were no longer preserved as fossils because the microbial mats that had aided in their preservation prior were no longer around. 3. The Ediacarans slowly went extinct as a newer fauna took their place, namely the fauna that we see having come to its fruition by the time of the Cambrian explosion of 530 to 510 million years ago. So let's take these three arguments in turn. The argument for an extinction event is the weakest of the three arguments, because the Ediacarans don't disappear from the fossil record in one false swoop, and instead species after species disappears across tens of millions of years, with the final result being that there are very few remaining by 539 million years ago. There is, however, some evidence for an extinction event. Specifically, there's an increase of carbon-12 relative to carbon-13 in the sediments from the end of the Ediacaran. It's thought that this indicates a decrease in the amount of photosynthetic bacteria. When such bacteria are around, they use carbon-12, but when they die, carbon-12 in the sediment increases because these life forms aren't holding it anymore. This kind of isotopic evidence is found by the five known major extinction events, and it may well point to at least some sort of crisis for life towards the end of the Ediacaran. The second argument is that the Ediacarans did not in fact, or at least many of the Ediacarans did not in fact, disappear at all, but rather the conditions necessary for their preservation were eliminated. 
The Ediacaran biota are soft-bodied, and yet some of them have been preserved in coarse sands. This doesn't easily compute, and it's been suggested that microbial mats would cover these biota after they had died and would serve as a protective coating that enabled their fossilization. While creatures such as Dickinsonia began consuming these microbial mats in the Ediacaran, across time creatures consumed them more and more. And by the time of the Cambrian, this argument would have it, they were simply being consumed to the point that the Ediacaran biota could no longer be preserved. This argument appears to hold at least some water, although most paleontologists would not agree that the Ediacaran biota continued to flourish as they did before by the time 539 million years ago came knocking. The third idea is the most widely held, although it's often held in intelligent connection with aspects of one or both of the first two. This argument has it that there was no mass extinction, but rather the Ediacarans were slowly rendered obsolete by new life forms. The fact that some Ediacaran forms fall from the fossil record across a range of tens of millions of years supports this hypothesis, and beyond that, we know that by the Cambrian, the water was far less hospitable for the mostly peaceful members of the Garden of Ediacara. By 539 million years ago, the age of the Ediacarans was over, and a new collection of species were coming to dominate the biosphere. We'll continue that story in the next video. You'll hear me then.